we're now going to take a look at the formula for the arc length along the curve of the function f between the points x equals a, x equals b on the x-axis. So our formula is going to wind up being arc length, it's the definite integral from a to b, the radical 1 plus f prime squared dx. We'll get to some examples in a little bit. First, let's just go a quick der derivation to make sure our, our formula is believable. So my approach is going to be, I'll use the tangent line to approximate the length of the curve. So the idea is to use integration, we're going to chop up our interval into little bits. Above each interval, there's going to be little bits of curve, and those little bits of curve I'll approximate with straight lines. Those straight lines are going to come from the tangent lines. Take a look. So what's the idea here? I have my curve f. I have my point x0. I'm going to pick another point x1 just for reference. I'm going to draw in my tangent line right here. Okay, let's note some things. The first thing to note is that the point on the curve and the tangent line is f of x0. f evaluated my point x0. I'm going to note another point, y of x1. So y is going to be my equation for the tangent line. We're interested in this right triangle here. So I'm going to need to know what this point is here. So that's going to be y of x1. And I'll be able to get that when I go to the equation of the tangent line. OK, let's note some things about this triangle. We're going to want to know how to get this thing L, which I'm calling the hypotenuse, the length of the hypotenuse. And using the Pythag Pythagorean theorem, we'll get that if we can get our hands on the base and the height. So the base is just going to be x1 minus x0, and I'll call that delta x. The height is just going to be the difference of y of x1, the tangent line evaluated at x1, and f of x0. So f of x0 is our value at this point. I can push that height all the way over to here. So we're just trying to get rid of that. We just want the height of the right triangle. So let's pull everything apart and see what we get. At x0, my tangent line has the equation y minus y0 m x minus x0. Well, my y0 is just going to be the point on the curve. So that's going to be f of x0. My slope is just going to be f prime of x0. And note, this is looking over here, sort of like what I want for the height of the right triangle. All I need to do is to put in x1. If I put x1 in for x, then this term here is going to turn into what I'm calling delta x. Now I have everything I need to get L. OK, let's forget about the delta for a second. So the L that I have up here is going to be radical delta x squared plus f prime delta x quantity squared. When we square everything, we'll note we could pull a delta x squared out of this. But to get it out of the radical, it'll come out as a delta x. What will be left over is radical 1 plus f prime at x0 squared. Now that's going to be it just for this little piece here. We're going to want this all over the curve. So the idea is we want to look at the big picture. Okay, So in the big picture, I would put something like that. So let's see what we have. I'm going to have my curve, f, between a and b. And the idea is we want to do the limit process for the integral. How will that work? Well, I'm going to take my interval, chop it up into much smaller subintervals, and then we're going to take a look at what happens when I chop up my curve into a bunch of these pieces above each segment. Each of those little pieces we're going to approximate with the straight line. And we know how to get the length of the straight line by the process we just did here. So what happens? We're looking at take all of those straight line lengths that I just computed, my delta Li's, and then we're going to take a sum over them. And then once we have the sum, we're going to take the limit as the delta x goes to 0, meaning these lengths we're going to squish down to a point. 
we're going to do it for each one in our chopping up process. When I let the length go down to zero in the limit, that's going to turn into what we're calling the definite integral. So let's see what happens. If I take the limit process with this as my function on the inside, well, in the large, delta x is notationally turned into dx. And then we're going to put everything under this definite integral sign from a to b, since a to b is our range. The only thing left is the radical 1 plus f prime of x0 quantity squared. And that's just going to be given by moving this function down. And whatever specific points I was looking at before, we just turn into an x now. So that's just f prime of x. That gives me my length formula for my curve. Let's look at some examples. First case, straight line segment on the line mx plus b from x0 to x1. The derivative here is just going to be m. So radical 1 plus the derivative squared is just radical 1 plus m squared. So the length is integral x0 to x1, radical 1 plus m squared dx. And then that's a constant, so we're just going to have radical 1 plus m squared x1 minus x0. So if I look at the picture, what do we have? We have right triangle. The rule for the line says if I go over by delta x, I go up by the slope times delta x, which is just going to be, in this case, m delta x. And then the hypotenuse is just the sum of the squares of the sides, square root. And then you see when you pull the delta x's out, we're just going to wind up with radical 1 plus m squared delta x. So the simplest case works out. Let's try one that should at least be familiar. I'm going to take a look at the upper semicircle, going from minus 1 to 1 on the unit circle. Okay, we have x squared plus y squared is 1. Solving for y gives me radical 1 minus x squared. And note, I'm going to use the positive solution. Radical only spits out positive numbers. Since I want the upper semicircle, I want positive y. So we don't, the minus sign we don't worry about. We call that f of x. Okay, rewrite f of x as 1 minus x squared to the 1 half. For the derivative, we bring the half down, take one off the exponent, multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is a minus 2x. Then we're going to square it. That's going to give me an x squared over a 1 minus x squared. Okay, so the 2's go away here, leaving me with a minus x. So we get the x squared. Then this is just radical 1 minus x in the bottom. And when I square it, it gets rid of the radical. I add 1 to this. I'll add 1 in the form 1 minus x squared over 1 minus x squared. And then you notice the x squareds cancel, leave me with a 1 over 1 minus x squared. We want the square root of this, so that's just putting a radical in the bottom. Okay, now note this is interesting. That says our arc length is going to be equal to the integral from minus 1 to 1 of dx over radical 1 minus x squared. And we should recognize this as the inverse sine. So inverse sine from 1 to minus 1. Okay, we evaluated those two points, take their difference. That For this, all I need to do is go to my unit circle and take a look at what um, values come out. So if I have sine inverse of x equal to theta, then sine of theta is equal to x. So we're looking at sine of theta equal to 1. Well, sine is the y value. So if I had sine theta equal to 1, that's saying y equals 1. That hits my unit circle in exactly one spot, pi halves. For our second point, sine theta equal to minus 1. Well, that's saying y equals minus 1. That hits my unit circle in exactly one point, minus pi halves. So we see that the length of the upper part of the unit circle is just going to be pi halves minus minus pi halves, which gives me pi. And that agrees with our formula for the entire circumference, which would be 2 pi. So that's agreeing with our formula. Our formula for arc length agrees with our formula for circumference. 
Okay, finally, now just for um, something with some different functions in it, we're going to take the catenary, also called the hanging chain. If I have two poles of equal height and I hang a chain between them, then this function here is going to give us the function for the hanging chain. So it's going to, it's, this curve is the graph of the catenary. So we'll take this curve here and we'll go from minus one to one. Okay, some maximal weirdness happens here. Let's take a look. Take the derivative, derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Derivative of e to the minus x is just e to the minus x, derivative of the top. So that just brings a minus sign down. I'm gonna square this. So squaring this, just note that squares, that squares with a plus, and then the cross term is gonna be minus two e to the x, e to the minus x, which just collapses to a two. Okay, all this goes over four since we squared. I'm gonna add a one. Well, we'll add one in the form of four over four. So that's just gonna turn the minus two into a plus two. If I wanna make this thing easy to look at, which I should at this step, I wanna get rid of the e to the minus two x because that looks you know, difficult to work with. So I can do that if I multiply everything by e to the two x over e to the two x. We push this through, get e to the 4x plus 2e to the 2x plus 1. Then I have a 4e to the 2x in the bottom. This top term now is the square of e to the 2x plus 1. Okay, just put in a y equal to 2x, and then you see everything matches up nicely. So when I go for the square root, the square root of this thing is going to be pretty clean. I'm going to have an e to the 2x plus 1 over 2e to the x. And then when I divide the e to the x into each term, I wind up with one half e to the x plus e to the minus x. And okay, you'll notice that's our original function. Okay, weird, but that's the way it is. All right, so now I can take a length. I have length going from minus one to one. My fun, well, of our arc length gadget so it's e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2 dx. Any derivatives, any derivative of e to the x is itself. Any derivative of e to the minus x, well, it's going to be itself. And then we have to divide by the derivative of the top. So that's just going to bring in a minus sign. We're going to go from minus 1 to 1. So I stick a 1 in for my first part. Gives me this. Sticking a minus 1 in just changes the order. So when I take the difference, we're just going to get e to the 1 minus e to the minus 1. And there's an actual number that goes with that, which will be roughly 2.35 if you go to the calculator.